Hello everyone, today in series of Talkplexus KOL interviews, we have with us Dr. Prakash Panya, who is a consultant endocrinologist at Astra Clinic Dubai since 2002. Thank you so much doctor for this interview. Thank you. How are you me. feeling today? Absolutely fine, how are you? That is wonderful, I'm pretty well as well. Uh, let me start by asking you some of the questions that our viewers are most eager to hear from you. Um, sure. In your expert opinion, what is the incidence of polycystic ovary syndrome in young women and what are the risk factors associated with it? Right, so polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS as we call them for short is one of a very common uh, metabolic endocrine disorder that young ladies uh, or ladies of all age uh, group uh, premenstrually uh, premenopausally uh, experience. Uh, the prevalence can vary from uh, country to country and from zone to zone, but you could say roughly it would be between 4 to 12 percent uh, with an average about 10 percent in the United States. So that's how common uh, PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome is. Now the next thing is why is it uh, very common and what would be the risk factors which would be associated with it? Well, uh, PCOS like type 2 diabetes or uh, dyslipidemia or blood pressure again is a lifestyle disorder. A lot of ladies think that they put on uh, weight because of PCOS. Actually that's not the case. It is uh, the weight gain which leads to the PCOS and not the PCOS which leads to the weight gain. So basically all the things that or all the problems that are associated with obesity would indirectly be associated with PCOS as well. So when you say what are the risk factors? The same risk factors which contribute towards diabetes and obesity like sedentary lifestyle, decreased physical activity, increased stress levels, these are things which could contribute towards PCOS. A uh, lot of these uh, children nowadays, uh, girls especially, they tend to be more sedentary. Uh, in uh, Dubai or UAE where I reside, uh, the weather conditions are pretty extreme and so the children don't go out much as probably we used to during our uh, school days and so their outdoor activities are much less and most of them are restricted to your gadgets and because of decreased activity and the increased junk food that they get exposed to, they, in a, they intake a lot of calories thereby putting in a lot of weight and that weight gain leads to certain hormonal changes which then leads to weight gain and that in turn leads to this syndrome of polycystic ovaries which is menstrual irregularities. So basically their periods get delayed. They may have hyperandrogenism or increased androgens or the male hormones wherein they get a lot of hair on the facial area, on the body, on the uh, legs and the, and the hands. Um, they can have acne that is pimples and they can also it can lead to infertility of the ladies planning for pregnancy. So, in short, the same risk factors associated with obesity and diabetes are also associated with PCOS and the main treatment for that would be weight loss, weight loss, weight loss. Diet and exercise, diet and exercise, diet and exercise. The same mantra fits for all. Um. And now, doctor, moving on to hypothyroidism. Uh, hypothyroidism is a lifetime condition, as we all know. In your opinion, how do you think it would be effectively managed with minimal side effects? Okay, so first and foremost, let me uh, tell your viewers that the treatment for hypothyroidism is without side effects. Coming to your question of lifetime disorder, the patient whom I just saw moments ago was a thyroid patient, and I had to break the news to him that he already knew he is a thyroid patient but I had to break the news that it is the treatment that it needs to be taken lifelong. He was not aware of that. So I had to educate him that yes the treatment has to be taken and the treatment has to be lifelong because like diabetes, thyroid is also a chronic disorder but it is an autoimmune disorder. It means your own immune cells consider the thyroid gland as alien, produce antibodies against them and cause it to shut down. And that shutdown usually occurs permanently. And what you're doing by giving thyroid hormone is just a replacement of what your thyroid gland would have otherwise produced, a synthetic thyroid hormone. 
but that thyroid hormone is absolutely 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 safe to be taken it is so safe it is so safe it is safe to be taken in pregnancy it is safe to be taken in lactating mothers it is safe in newborn children who have congenital hypothyroidism safe in babies any age group it is safe yes the dosing has to be appropriate you don't want to overdose well too much or too less of anything is bad in any case so you have to dose him correctly or him or her correctly and be uh, assured that the if the medicine is given at the right dose and monitored appropriately the patient would have no side effects because what you're doing is you're just replacing the thyroid gland uh, with the hormone which it is not producing an underactive thyroid gland is being replaced with the appropriate uh, this thing if you are overdosing you may get palpitations shivering of the hands etc if you are underdosing the same symptoms of hypothyroidism like tiredness lethargy fatigue menstrual irregularities all that may persist so side effects are in underdosing or overdosing but at appropriate dosing there is no side effect and when and i'd like to again through your channel i'd like to bring it to the notice of the audience in large of course this is probably directed towards the doctors but even to the audience that you know when patients are looking at alternative source of medicine for treating thyroid they look at homeopathy they they look at uh, ayurveda they look at yoga to treat thyroid then i ask the question why would you like to look at an alternative source when you have a drug which is so safe that can be used in pregnancy also so safe so effective so cheap that there is no second to thyroxine medicine i mean there was after thyroxine they, they, they didn't need to invent anything else because it was so self sufficient so something you have got a very powerful drug and a very effective drug and a very very safe drug so there is no side effect please use it of course have it monitored just because i am saying it's safe doesn't mean take it and then sleep over it no keep getting it monitored from time to time like the previous gentleman he got his thyroid checked within 2 months he saw, he saw it shot up so it had to be rechecked and those had to be tightened again and once it is settled then i think on a periodic basis the doctor will advise you when to check it so very safe drug in today um and doctor again according to you in all your years of experience what would you say is the best treatment of choice for hypopituitarism okay so uh, for the sake of the uh, uh, audience hypopituitarism is a condition where the pituitary gland doesn't produce its pituitary hormones and uh, the pituitary gland is the uh, master gland or what you call a band master of an orchestra <laughs> and if you can suppose if you can pan out and see that chart over there well uh, there is uh, the pituitary gland regulates the function of all the endocrine glands so for some reasons because of some th uh, pituitary surgery or because of some uh, infectious diseases infiltrative diseases or some problem or the other or, uh, where the pituitary gland doesn't produces its hormones it so there is a deficiency of all the hormones in the body so correct so the thing is that when the pituitary gland is not producing the hormones first and foremost you have to suspect it and then you have to check ask check for it and because there are multiple glands which can be involved it is just not testing for one particular hormone all the pituitary gla gland functioning hormones like you have the growth hormone you have the cortisol you have the thyroid function you have the gonadotropins which regulate the menstrual cycles so all these uh, prolactin these are all the hormones which need to be checked to see if they are also deficient or not sometimes you may have to do some dynamic testing because if you just do a baseline value the reading may be just borderline and you may not be able to actually pick up whether it's deficient or not when you do some dynamic testing you can bring out the real deficiency or not in them so once you have identified the deficiency of the hormones you have to prioritize which are the hormones that you need to start first because you need to give them in order of sequence because if you shoot the climax before the beginning it will be a problem so you shoot the beginning first and then shoot the climax towards the end so the hormones which are most important to life for example you replace the cortisol or the steroids glucocorticoids you replace that first once you have got that going then you replace the thyroid function and then you also see that the gonadotropins that means the menstrual irregularities are occurring you fix that so that the menstrual cycles come and lastly of course if, if it is a child the growth hormone is also very important you then start replacing with growth hormone in adults because you would argue that doctor the 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 growth process is over do we need to give growth hormone in such people well it affects the quality of life 
it it helps a lot of important metabolic performances so though despite the growth is over a uh, growth hormone can be considered in elderly people also but the other three things like the cortisol that is the glucocorticoids the thyroid hormones and the gonadotropins like for example testosterone in males and the estrogen uh, in females now these are very important because you need to keep those things going so first the steroids then the thyroid replacement and then the uh, gonadotropins so that the uh, menstrual irregularities uh, the uh, uh, the sexual function improves and then the growth hormone if you keep in mind that when you replace one and then you're taking the other when you're taking the other the first can get slightly altered so you you once you replace that you need to go back and then and fix that again if need be so basically if you do it in sequence and do it appropriately you should be able to replace all the hormones which the master gland had originally planned to do but couldn't do because of whatever reasons it's not functioning so gradual and steady uh, and and uh, again uh, important thing is the steroid could uh, when you are replacing it could be life threatening so we have to identify that it's a life threatening condition and we have to replace it adequately and even give a support that it, and tell the patient that if suppose a patient has some critical condition uh, like vomiting uh, he is not able to take anything so he has to double the dose of the steroid during those critical periods uh, and if you do that well i'm sure that the replacement will be adequate and and the the patient would function like any other human being and now we would like to talk about you know two of the important medications so in terms of uh, thyroxine and cortisol in particular how do you think they would help in the regulation of growth hormone deficiency but as i said uh, so these are the things which come in the sequence that i had mentioned earlier uh, and because see what happens is when there is a deficiency of all the hormones everything becomes sluggish and you know everything happens in slow motion and then you are replacing one and then uh, and then then and then uh, uh, and things come on to be better life then you replace the other and things get better and as i said when you give one the other gets slightly disturbed so when you are first you are replacing the cortisol once the cortisol is going you are replacing the thyroxine mm -hmm. once you replace the thyroxine you need to go back and see because see what happens is when you the th when you are having hypothyroidism the metabolic rate is very low everything is happening in slow motion once you fix that the metabolism improves so the cortisol that you replace first then you fix up the thyroid correct right. so once you fix the thyroid the metabolism improves so the metabolism of the cortisol also starts improving oh. so you need to increase it or slightly step up the dose of the cortisol so that it yes. functions in phases same thing is with growth hormone when you fix the thyroid and the uh, uh, cord uh, cortisol what happens many times when there is a deficiency of thyroid the growth hormone deficiency may be masked you may not pick up growth hormone deficiency because of the decreased metabolism once you fix up the thyroid function then the growth hormone deficiency is manifested appropriately as it is then you get the clear picture of how much the deficiency is so that you can test it correctly and then treat it accordingly suppose if there was a suppose now the patient didn't have a thyroid problem you're just having growth hormone problem you you are treating with growth hormone correct you realize that there is a thyroid problem as well you fix the thyroid i said the metabolism improves once the metabolism improves the growth hormone starts getting metabolized faster so you need a higher dose of growth hormone when you fix up the thyroid so these are all you know they play with each other and you have to keep a watch on all of them and see that you are fixing all of it properly at uh, at at one time and now again moving on to the basics um could you elaborate a bit for our audience on the differences between type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes well okay uh, so these are the common type of uh, diabetes that we encounter in our practice of course the type 2 diabetes is the most commonest type of uh, diabetes and then we have the type 1 as well yes there are other types of diabetes also but we will not talk about that because the discussions on type 1 and type 2 so uh, academically what we were taught was that uh, type 1 diabetes is the one that we see in children type 2 is what we see in middle aged and elderly people but the roles are reversing a bit so we have type 1 diabetes where they have a bimodal presentation where you have a very young or the children young children adolescents having type 1 diabetes and a second peak can occur at late age maybe in the late 60s and 70s also when they can have type 1 diabetes having said that there is something which is known as type 1 and 1/2 also which i'll talk about later on <laughs> so it's further confusing the issue uh, and these are the one you, type 1 of course is in seen in children they are lean and they have a very sudden onset of uh, presentation 
where within a period, uh, uh, the child was okay uh, a few weeks ago, he may have had some viral infection, uh, and all of a sudden he, uh, the mother will complain that he started losing a lot of weight, started drinking a lot of water, started passing a lot of urine, and within a matter of time he deteriorated, and if care is not taken, Regarding the warning signs of type 1 diabetes, the patient may gradually slip into a coma and can you know, be hospitalized in the ICU if not uh, if recognized properly. So this is what you see in type 1 where it's an autoimmune problem where the antibodies get directed against the pancreas which produces insulin, bombard it, shut it down. So it's more or less happens pretty acutely or pretty fast where the uh, insulin production was okay one month ago and it's almost zero the next time. So basically no insulin production, absolute insulin deficiency in type 1 diabetes, the one in children, where they need to be uh, treated with insulin and only insulin. Of course uh, with IV fluids uh, in the initial stages, but insulin is what you require and the regular insulin that the body produces with each meal and at bedtime. So multiple doses of insulin are required for the management of type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes usually seen in middle-aged and elderly people but we are seeing a lot of obese children and adolescents who are obese also developing type 2 diabetes. Their diabetes is not type 1 that I told you is more common in children. They are type 2 diabetes which are usually a reason uh, because of insulin deficiency not as much as in type 1 but relative insulin deficiency and mostly insulin resistance. When I talk insulin resistance, means patients with obesity, in such patients, the insulin in the body it doesn't act as well as it should because of the resistance that obesity offers to the action of insulin. So they have a dual defect, insulin deficiency, which is just relative, and insulin resistance because of obesity, usually seen, as I said, in middle-aged and elderly, but also seen in children and adolescents. And these people can be managed, it's basically a hereditary factor as well as a lifestyle disorder because of the wrong eating habits that I talked about in, as in PCOS. Wrong eating habits, sedentary lifestyle, physical inactivity, uh, eating all the junk food etc. So if you regulate that, then you can, so type 2 diabetes can be managed with lifestyle improvement, diet, exercise, uh, you need to be educated about diabetes and then you can treat it with appropriate medications. In type 2 diabetes, you can try drugs. In type 1 diabetes, it has to be insulin. It's a different matter that people with type 2 diabetes, as the years pass on, because it's a chronic and a progressive disorder, you may require multiple medications and you may eventually require insulin uh, as well. So, so type 2 diabetes can require insulin, but type 1 diabetes do require insulin. There's something which is known as type 1 and half also, but then we'll leave that probably for some, some time <laughs> else and not confuse the uh, audience a little more. Thank you so much, Doctor, for your invaluable perspectives and the information that you have provided us. I'm very sure our viewers are going to greatly benefit from this information. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.